You're listening to The Dental Guys, Determinants of Facial Growth with Dr. Rebecca Bacow. In this episode, we bring Dr. Rebecca Bacow on for the first in a series of episodes concerning the most modern way to approach facial growth, sleep apnea, and growth and development. We talk about what we can change and what we can't about facial growth patterns in the child and adult patient and what is newest and most controversial in ways to manage both the muscular and skeletal growth and development of each patient. It's all right here on The Dental Guys. When the dental guys need an infection prevention product, we turn to Kerr and their Total Care line. Kerr has been an industry leader in infection control and prevention products for years. And when we think of infection control, Cavicide and Cavi wipes are the first things that come out of our minds. It's automatic, and there's a reason for that. Kerr knows dentistry and their products work. The Dental Guys trust Kerr products in our offices, and you should too. Stay safe with Kerr Total Care. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes The Dental Guy. And I mean, Wes, have we not been excited about this show coming back to Becca Baca? I mean, is it? And first of all, I'm just going to say, she's listening to this, of course. It's one of my most favorite names to say. It just rolls off the tongue. Becca Baca. Becca Baca. It's perfect. It. All right. So well, I'll tell I'm you excited what. because she brings it every single time. She brings both the knowledge and also the controversies to light and kind of debunks that. And we're going to talk about some cool science as well. But before we get into the meat of the show, Wes, What's going on with your schedule these days? How's how's it looking? It's got any holes? Like, you got any holes? <laughs> it seems like the holes are far and few between. I mean, imagine today a patient calling and saying, "Hey, I need to get scheduled for that uh, that crown." Yeah. Right? That, how that how crown. far out are you? Corn crown, right? One hour appointments. What I schedule for corn crown, right? Um, end of what September, John. End of September, oh, yeah. and right now it's the end of July. Right. Yeah, I'm feeling and, it. And, you know, one of the things about managing a busy schedule. Now, we have an issue right now in our office with space because I have an associate in a five operatory practice and trying to share and navigate all that is it's intense. So we're not going to talk about navigating two doctors in a five op practice with three and a half hygienists. <laughs> we're t- no, we're, we're going to talk. We're not going to talk about that and how we did that. We can talk about that on another show because it's working. Yeah, that's a However, whole other show. That's creative scheduling, right? And I'm sure many of you probably want to know how to do that. But what we're going to talk about just in this brief moment of time, right, is the idea of creating blocks, right? Mm-hmm. Block scheduling, right? And we've been doing this for years, and this is one of the keys to making sure that you're available for your patients. Okay, so John, I'll tell you what. We haven't even talked about this before the show, but I'll tell you No, this is all just off the cuff right now. This is our system. So right now, we have for our practice set aside a certain X number of new patients at the beginning of several months in advance there are actually gray blocks in our practice mon- management mm-hmm. software that says don't touch me basically is what it means until a certain time right mm-hmm. and so based on the number of new patients that we've determined that we want to set for that particular month those blocks get put in by the scheduling coordinator and then they are filled with new patients now that could be on the doctor side or on the hygiene side so it's both it's appropriate for both sides of the chair on top of that we have also the system of when does that block actually come off right Mm -hmm. well obviously Mm -hmm. it comes off for only new patient exams now we're talking about anybody we're not talking about reactivations we're talking about true new patients, people that have not been to my practice ever, right? Reactivations is a different, different system. So 
what we do is we say those blocks are re reserved for only new patients yeah. up until one week prior. One week, okay. one week <clears throat> yep. prior. And so that means today is Monday. That means that if there's a block on the schedule this week that hasn't been filled with a new patient, well, guess what? That can be filled with something else, right? Or yep. makes sense. Ne uh, a, you know, pretty much on Monday, this week's block should be filled with new patients. Or if they're not, they're getting scheduled with pr productive procedures such as, you know, yeah. crown and bridge. And, and so what we've done is we've basically said same kind of thing, overwhelmed, demand is high, don't have the space, which is, I mean, not the space, but the place on the schedule. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about this in the, in the past, you know, there's two faucets, right. That you can turn on and off. You can turn on the faucet of everybody goes through the doctor or everybody goes through hygiene, or you can do a mix. Mm -hmm. And so where we've been trying to mix that and allow patients to kind of come in the way they want to come in, which I still believe in allowing the patient to determine if they come in to see the doctor or the hygienist. Thank you, Gary DeWood, right? That's right. Gary DeWood from Spear, all credit goes to him for that one. Because then if the patient says I'm healthy and they go to hygiene, they have a bunch of problems. They go, oh, well, turns out you're not healthy. You're the one who told us you were healthy. So now this is your problem in your court. You're going to need to come back and see the doctor. And that's worked very well because it doesn't waste as much time for me. And it lets the patient kind of determine their path to discovery essentially is what happens. So that's worked well. But now we're at a point where literally just don't even have time on either schedule. So now we're actually having to lock down new patients. And we're talking about going to a situation of we're not accepting new patients, which is crazy. It's crazy, but it's it's a good problem to have, and it's also a bad problem to have because you know you have to again. That's a faucet. You have to be careful. And is it you know? So we're talking about having discussions about by invitation only or invited by somebody. So now the question is: When you answer the phone, do you say who invited you to our practice? Which that's a, a, a way you can do it. And if the patient has a connection, then you kind of allow them in and it creates this exclusivity. Now, I know yep. some of you guys out there listening to this might be thinking, come on, you know, I'm not, are you guys crazy? You know, is this really a problem you have? Maybe you're not in this problem. I mean, obviously, like, I feel very thankful that this is a situation that I'm, that I'm in, you know, but, but, you know, the truth is that this is just, this is not a problem you always have, but right now it's a problem that we're dealing with. So all I can say is that, you know, you're going to end up, I think in the long run, realizing that you have to manage this at some point in your practice, right? It's going to come probably if you're doing a good job that you have to figure out a way to manage this new patient intake into the practice if you're very busy and we're figuring it out as we go. It's not perfect but we're figuring out as we go. So I think, you know, Wes, you know, are you finding you're in the process of adding space of, of, of adding operatories of changing that that's going to make, I feel like a big difference with this for you. Yeah. I think that there's a couple ways to actually control the funnel, right. In a practice. And what John is talking about is he is narrowing his funnel, um, by, you know, doing certain things, right? In our practice, our funnel has been a little wider uh, because we are bringing on, we have brought on an associate. Um, we don't participate in really many insurance plans. I mean, it's like one Delta and then another one that's Humana. It's a special type thing. So we've even discussed, right, in our practice right now, do we actually go to an invite only? It's funny you bring this up. Do we stop accepting new patients unless they're an invite only, right? Until you've got the capacity. And this is the thing, like what I would love to hear if you're listening to this, because <clears throat> obviously we want to get to the main part of the show, but we both are kind of struggling with some of the same things. Some of you guys out there, some of you girls may be dealing with some of the same things. What are you doing that's working? We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear about scheduling you know, problems that you've solved, how you've solved them. We'd love to hear, maybe this is a whole other show, Wes, that we need to have at some point of, I think it would know, be great. You know who would be great to have on this show is some people that we really um, have utilized for these type of questions over the years, John. And, mm -hmm. and so if you have somebody that you'd like to hear of, that you'd like the dental guys to, you know, bring on to talk a little bit about creative scheduling and how to control these funnels, 
I mean, some of you might even be saying, well, I don't have that problem and I, I may have a full schedule, but it falls apart. That's a totally yep. different situation, right? Or I don't, you know, maybe you don't have the systems in place even to maintain a schedule that is full all the time. And, you know, it is so rare in our practice to have an open hole. Even if a cancellation happens, it's usually filled just like that because we have systems in place, you know? Right. And that's a season we're in right now that we won't always be in. And this is all moving target, right? You're going to have times where you're like this. You're going to have times when, you know, you have more open time and both of them are, are, it's part of the cycles of business. But this is a cycle of business that we haven't seen, at least I haven't seen exactly like this ever. So, you know, it's it's a great conversation. You know, send us your feedback. If like you say, there's people you want us to have on to talk about this. We have some people in mind, but always looking for feedback. And Wes, I'm super excited about this show that was about to come up here in just a couple of minutes with Becca Bacow talking about what we know now about growth and development and how what we can change, what we can't. This is this is the newest and the best. And so we're excited to kind of kick off this series. So after a word from our sponsor, we'll be right back with Rebecca Bacow. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbray with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. It may feel counterintuitive to seek help in your practice. After all, you're the one that put in thousands of hours studying and practicing your trade to get where you are now. But in all that time spent learning your skill, How much time did you spend on tax strategy, financial planning, or legal services? You're an expert in the field, but like the rest of us, we have blind spots. Don't try to do it all by yourself. Having a competent tax planner, financial advisor, and an attorney to support you allows you freedom to focus on what you're best at. For more information about this and other dental-related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. Well, welcome back to The Dental Guys after that word from our sponsor. And we, as we said before, are very excited about this episode. Uh, we have had uh, Rebecca Bacow, Dr. Rebecca Bacow on before, and uh, it's always been challenging in a good way, uh, not only to us, but uh, to our listeners. And uh, there's been quite a few, uh, I think, maybe controversial things that that, that we've heard from uh, that world uh, of discussing airway, jaw growth and development, especially when orthodontists kind of, you know, maybe butt heads a little bit about where this is going. And, and we feel like we've got, yeah, fights straight up. Let's just say it, right? This is, well, I've been some told, John, a few things, right? I've been told that it's a fad, <laughs> right? I mean, like people uh. have said that about me, like I'm practicing fad dentistry. So <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so we we have uh, one of the authorities on this topic uh, on the show today. So we're going to bring Dr. Baca on. Thanks for being back with us on The Dental Guys. Oh, thank you guys for having me. It's an honor and a privilege. We're, we're excited to have you. We When we kind of last left off, when we were last had you on the show, we were discussing uh, a lot about specific treatment options and this was we got really into some details and some nitty-gritty about some of the newest combination surgical and orthodontic treatments to you know we're talking about adult treatment a lot at that time um but i want to talk a little bit about kind of what you're up to these days first you know let's let's talk about you know what's happening in your world obviously it's the post-covid era we're starting to see you know continue education in person coming back Um, we're starting to see our practices full of people that are wanting to be healthier. I mean, I'm definitely seeing that, that there's more of a focus on health. Uh, talk a little bit about what you're seeing in your practice and kind of what you're doing professionally right now. And, um, for those of you who don't know Dr. Baca, maybe introduce just a little bit about who you are and kind of what you do. Sure. So, um, dual trained orthodontist, periodontist. My history when I finished, so a little history about our program, I I went to University of Pennsylvania and historically it really focused on expansion. And one of the few programs that really makes that a central piece is looking at what we call the transverse dimension. So a lot of our, we we were doing TAD expanders even in our residency program. 
and when I finished my program, I had the opportunity to sit through a three-day course with Jeff Rouse, Airway Prosthodontics. Uh, this was before he had joined Spear Education. And I remember sitting in the front row and watching adult after adult after adult patient with sleep apnea. And I thought, these are all orthodontic problems. And really mm. allowed me to dive at first into not the orthodontic literature so much, but ENT literature, sleep literature, really trying to gain an understanding of this interplay between what's going on with the skeletal components and how does that relate to airway and sleep. And it, it was sort of this this aha moment sitting through that course that really changed the trajectory of my professional life and how, how we treatment plan patients in our practice today. And so I know the three of us, we talk a lot about uh, how the, yes, we can do a lot of these adult surgical cases and that is a big part of our practice. But what really interests me is how do we prevent surgery? How do we prevent these airway and sleep issues? And so much of it happens early on in skeletal growth and development. So what's driving the growth in the wrong direction? A big thing that is a negative contributor to growth and development, well, I would say a handful of things. A, um, a big piece is mouth breathing. So let's talk for a little bit about what mouth breathing does. So when a child is mouth breathing, number one, if we think about the mandible, the mandible is dropping down and back. The tongue is a muscle and it inserts into the mandible. And so if that tongue posture is low, the mandible is going to be low and we get a downward backward growth of the mandible. Now that can be, that can have a vertical component or it can be more brachyfacial component. But if the tongue is down and back, it's actually the tongue up and forward that drives the growth of the maxilla. So now you can have a patient potentially with an underdeveloped lower jaw but now you also have an underdeveloped upper jaw. The roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. And so when you have an underdeveloped upper jaw, you tend to have underdeveloped nasal passages. And so now you have a patient and it becomes a cycle. So now they can't breathe well through their nose, so they breathe more through their mouth. Lower jaw can continue to drop down and back. You might have open bites, you might have long faces, you might have gummy smiles, you might have a crossbite. All of these things that could potentially happen from mouth breathing. Now it gets even more interesting because as we mouth, now the nose is a natural filter. You think sort of use it or lose it. And so as we become more mouth breathers, once again, the nose is less efficient. And as we breathe in pollens and dust and allergens, that tissue in our pharyngeal airway space can become hypertrophic. So we can see adenoids and tonsils. And so now it compounds the problem because now you have a child that's mouth breathing and now we've got adenoids and tonsils making it more difficult to nasal breathe. And so the next big question becomes, how do we get them out of this pattern? So you may see them at six, seven, eight years old, and they may complain of chronic runny noses. Mom may say that they're always breathing with their mouth open. Maybe they're snoring at night. Maybe they're tossing and turning. Maybe they're having difficulty with focusing in school, attention. They're not able to sit still and do their homework. Um, I know I've heard a lot of this from parents. It's hard enough this past year with homeschool and and if your kid wasn't sleeping well, it really compounded problems for a lot of families. Uh, so the ramifications of mouth breathing go on and on and on. And from a growth and development standpoint, it might manifest as crowding too, because now the jaws are underdeveloped, so there's not enough room for the teeth to come in. And so trying to unravel this in these kids is really where I get really excited professionally in terms of how can we help these kids and and it really becomes an interdisciplinary approach mm. one thing that Got you it. said there i think that makes the connection with what dr jeff roush talks about in airway prosthodontics is his key is nasal breathing in fact 
Um, if you know anything about the protocol that he and Greg Kinzer uh, created that you can actually take courses on, it's called Seattle Protocol because they figured, you know, that they developed this in the this, uh, city of Seattle practicing together for 18 months to two years, I think it was. But him and Greg determined that the, the key to moving forward in airway prosthodontics is nasal breathing, and that cannot be achieved. In fact, the first step of the protocol is to achieve nasal breathing um, by mouth taping. If that cannot be done, then you will stop the protocol and refer to these uh, specialists, which would be an ENT, sleep physician, could be anybody that we can help, help that person get better. And so this is the connection here. I find it interesting that we can take something that we see in adults, right? Because when you become aware of this, this is what you said, you can't unsee it. And like for John and I, that was the same progression is like we saw the problem in adults, but we were like, but can we influence our children? And that, right. that, that gets you excited. So let's talk about that sure. a little bit as far as what, what are some of the things that we can influence? And maybe let's talk about skeletal growth and what are some of the ways that we can, you know, you obviously talked about the ways that, uh, it, that not having nasal breathing, having incorrect tongue posture, what that does to skeletal growth. And so we kind of know some of the, the problems. Um, let's talk about what we can influence, you know, what all can we change with that? Or what are some of the major areas that we should be focusing on? And we're going to kind of make this the very basic at first, you know, for people that might not be as familiar with this because just a little teaser we're going to be you know leading into you know some more shows with uh, dr bacow where we're going to go into more of the interdisciplinary treatment of this you know who do you need to have on your team and who does what in what order uh, we've kind of hit that before but there's a lot of updates to that um, but let's talk about what we can what can we change and what do we what do we struggle to change and then we'll talk a little bit about maybe some examples of that and some some case stuff yeah so like i mentioned there's often a lot to unravel and so, like, like you mentioned, the, the key really is how do we get these kids to breathe through their nose, tongue up, lips together. That's really the end goal, to get the mandible forward, to get the maxilla forward, to get that tongue up. And so the first, the first thing we often consider is expansion. So let's talk a little bit about maxillary expansion. So the, the, the upper jaw is made up of a series of bony plates that meet at sutures. And my staff teases me because I probably say this 10, 12, 15 times a day, but the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. And so the more we widen the maxilla, the more we can open up nasal passages. The more we open up nasal passages, the more efficient nasal breathing becomes. There's areas where the nose can drain. And so as we open everything up, things can drain. So we, we've found uh, a number of instances of sinusitis even in children and when we complete the expansion that's that will often drain which is pretty unbelievable because in children most if it's it's often a viral infection and the only way to really treat that or manage that is nasal steroids so we see turbinates shrink we see uh, the the nasal cavities open we see sinuses drain and then as we create more room for the tongue we can get a change in tongue posture. Now that assumes they don't have a tongue tie, but uh, as we open that oral volume, that tongue can come up and forward. Now that child that couldn't uh, breathe with their lips together, now they can. And so lips can come together, tongue can come up, and that's gonna help drive the growth of the lower jaw forward. And so the ultimate goal is to reverse the cycle. Do we refer to ENT all the time? And so this really becomes an interdisciplinary treatment plan. But our first option very often is expansion as we open everything up. And then we can follow that up with myofunctional therapy, tongue tie release. Uh, there's sometimes where we'll go to the ENT prior to expansion, sometimes during, and, and now uh, often after. A little, little spoiler alert sort of, but uh, a, a few of us in our orthodontic world have noticed that as we expand, we are starting to see adenoids and tonsils shrink. And so look out for some publications to come in the future 
because it's pretty exciting that we're able to show anywhere from 20 to 60 percent shrinkage of adenoids and tonsils following expansion. So wow. stay tuned for that. Wow. And that's something that I, we keep seeing, right, is that it seems like the more literature, the more data is being produced by more and more people getting involved with this, we keep seeing just other effects of it's kind of in some ways mirrors how we see treating you know, sleep apnea in certain ways. It's like it's there's so many areas that it affects in, uh, in, a, in a person's life uh, that we didn't even really know. I think until we started looking at them and then also, oh, that metric also improves and that metric also improves. But we're talking about what let's, let's maybe go through, I think is a good time. If you think so, Wes, to maybe go through a, a couple of examples for those of you who have access to the video version of this. If you don't turn off the lawnmower, stop the car, pull over and open the YouTube version of this because you're going to want to see this because, uh, to say these are, maybe uh, have created a little controversy, I think is, is a fair, fair statement because they seem almost maybe too good to be true for somebody who doesn't understand what's really going on. Um, well, let's put that up, Wes. You've got some some before and after and and Dr. Bakov, if you could walk us through a little bit, what what are we looking at here? Um, um, what what should we be if, if somebody's maybe not familiar with looking at um, the CT, you know, what are, what are some areas or what are some, some changes that we're seeing here? Cause of course this, this looks pretty, pretty amazing. Sure. So this is an eight year old boy that presented with some mouth breathing habits, difficulty sleeping through the night and some issues with anxiety. And he also presented with a clinical crossbite and a tighter tongue connection. And our treatment plan included upper expansion and some lower uprighting. And this is before and after we're looking at the x-ray. This is eight months from x-ray one to x-ray two, maybe eight or nine months. And I wanna draw your attention to the nasal spaces and the turbinates on the his, um, I, I think that's his left side, just based on how this is oriented, but, but it, on the screen, it's your right side. And so a pretty significant change just uh, in that short period of time do we see such profound changes in adults? Not quite as dramatic. So that's why it's pretty exciting to be able to do this on kids. And I think if you go to the next slide, there's a few of the same patient. This is the same patient. And I've highlighted here the pharyngeal airway space. Now, the, what we're looking at here at the, at the top portion behind the nasal cavity, that's the adenoids. And we see that the adenoids are shrinking and the soft, there's just more room between the adenoids and the soft palate. So the di dimensional changes, remember there's, there's three dimensions here. So we're just looking two dimensionally. So this is pretty dramatic. And that, that increase in dimension goes all the way down to the back of the throat. This is before he's had any myofunctional therapy or tongue tie release. This is all just from making more oral volume. That tongue can come forward. He's able to breathe better through his nose. So the, the, images are just a, a snapshot of how much better this young man is doing. So clinically, mom says he's not waking up through the night anymore. He's not as anxious. Behavior has improved. Attention has improved. And he's growing better. I want to stop mm. right there because I think that something is interesting here to talk a little bit about is the clinical impression that you can get from an enlarged turbinate. And one of the things that we implemented in our practice is a turbinate evaluation and it's it's simple as taking you know at the you know the tip of the nose and tipping it up and most of us wear LED headlamps now so that we can actually look into the nasal passages and assess clarity um, I always like to say to kids I'm gonna just check and see if there's any bats in the cave and um, you know they always get a truck chuckle out of that because everybody knows what that is and, but it's interesting to me when you start comparing what you see radiographically with what we see in children. One of the things mm -hmm. that um, has been established in our ENT um, uh, uh, specialist is the ability to, to uh, you know, quantify, right, um, basically how stenotic a nose is, and that's the difficulty in breathing. And for parents, what we do in our practice is we'll close one nostril off, We'll have them inhale, and you can actually see constriction on the yep. side 
that is, um, you know, more constricted on the CT. It, it happens all the time. Um, but these are things that you can help to ascertain clinically, right, Becca? I think talk a little bit about some of the things you see in children that have these two impressions, enlarged adenoids um, and enlarged turbinate. Absolutely. Yeah, well, and, and even just asking some of those leading questions. For the listeners that haven't included it uh, in their intake form, we find that the Shervin Pediatric Sleep Questionnaire is a really helpful tool for starting the discussion for parents. So it's a, it's a one-page you can download it from the internet. The background from that, the original paper is interesting. Um, It was, his his whole mission was to their access to care. So not everyone, not every family has the ability to get a sleep study in children. It can be expensive. It, It, not every place has a facility that can accommodate kids. And so he set out, Dr. Shervin, it, could there be a one page questionnaire that is highly correlated with a positive sleep study. And he put together this questionnaire. So if there's a certain number of yeses, there's a a high likelihood that that child has a sleep disorder. And it's things like, is your child wetting the bed? Does your child snore? There's some attention questions in there. And these are not things that parents think to tell the dentist, let alone the orthodontist, right? No one is really talking to their orthodontist about bedwetting. So we get that question from parents all the time. Well, I saw that you put this on your intake form. Why were you asking me this? Um, Am I supposed to tell you this? And so asking some of these questions to start that conversation becomes really key in identifying which kids have a problem. Uh, And and so then we can start our, our exam and really look at functionality even just talking to them, seeing are they sitting upright? Are they pay, are they fidgety? And certainly how are they breathing? Are they just sitting there with their mouth open? I know it's tricky with masks on these days, but it also is pretty nice to look at the parents. There is a big genetic component too. So, so sort of going back to this, we were able to get him to come. You can even see lips come together if you look at the before and after CBCTs here. So he was, uh, pretty much an obligate mouth breather and converted to a nose breather. Mm. Mm. And I think we have, we have another picture, I think of this same, two more of this same young man. So um, as we look here, um, as we opened up the maxilla, we opened up the floor of the nose and that whole nasal cavity opened up. Now I'm sure a lot of the dentists are looking at the tipping of tooth number 14. Don't worry about that. We tipped it right back in. Um, But, but look at, not only did we widen the nasal floor, but we also created more space for the tongue. You can see in the before picture with the crossbite that that tongue just couldn't rise to the roof of the mouth. And, and remember from the prior picture, we opened up the pharyngeal airway space and that's really because that tongue had room to come forward. I think about the tongue, I think about like a water balloon, right? So it sort of has the fixed dimension. It is what it is. And so as we create more space for it, it's able to shift forward. And that's where we start to see some of those changes. And so if our mission is to guide growth and to create healthy patients, healthy airways, healthy occlusion, lips at rest, tongue up and forward, expansion becomes really a powerful intervention. Maybe touch Mm. a little bit on the power of genetics. You mentioned that briefly. Um, You know, a lot of people maybe are naysayers say, heard that we can't really overcome this so why not just wait till age 12 and put your braces on and do things then because well it's just my jaw was small and dad's jaw was small and you know they're just gonna and maybe even parents say that right I mean that's kind of a barrier tough discussion sometimes but even in the orthodontic community it seems like that there seems to be well it's just genetics that's the way they're going to grow talk a little bit about that sure um Well, there's some truth in the sense that genetics plays a big role in skeletal growth and development, uh, but also in sleep and airway issues. If you're a parent and you have sleep apnea, statistically, your kid is also very likely to have a sleep disorder, sleep and breathing disorder. But we have to sort of piece apart how much of this is, well, you toss your hands up, it is what it is. 
Um, but, but maybe the other pieces are genetic as well. So for example, mom has enlarged adenoids and tonsils and a crossbite. So all three of her kids have enlarged adenoids, tonsils, and a crossbite. Does that mean you're not going to treat them? All four of them have an airway issue. And so, mm -hmm. yes, there's a genetic component, but that doesn't mean we're still not going to treat them. So for the kids, yep. we, we correct all, all the crossbites. For the mom, maybe it's a TAD expander. For the kids, uh, maybe it's more like a Hyrax, but they all probably are going to be evaluated by ENT as well. So just because it's genetic doesn't mean we're not going to treat it. Mm. Mm. It seems like an easy, easy discussion to have. It kind of just, well, fact is, you know, here are the problems that result from this type of airway situation, this type of jaw situation. And, you know, it's really, that just means everybody needs treatment instead of, you know, it's just inevitable that we're all going to end up the same uh, because uh, you don't, you, you can't, it's an interesting conversation because of course this all goes back to, you know, that you could really nerd out on the anthropology of yes. what caused, you know, the, all these changes over generations and, you know, over the last say thousand years, 500 years and hundred years, uh, that's, that's resulted in the way our, our genetics look being different. Uh, but it's just the easiest answer is just to say, Hey, that is, we are where we are now. We know what this is doing and we know how to treat it. Well, when my and, kids' braces uh, done, are done, John, maybe I need to get braces, right? I mean, that that actually starts to yep. lead into that with the adult that's in the chair watching you do the exam. They're like, yeah, I've had these problems too. Maybe I need to get braces yep. and expansion as well. I mean, happens. Well, because these are the people, I mean, when it really comes down to it, if you're listening to this, if you are, say, a general dentist who's just maybe on the tip of the iceberg of some of this discussion, I mean, where this really started with Wes and I, if we're honest, it was selfish and I'll tell you why we don't want people breaking our stuff, you know, and people that break our stuff, I'm talking about our ceramics and our nice reconstructions and things like that. That really is kind of where it started. I think with us of just saying, well, what, what's really going on here? And this is in our adult population. And so as you start kind of backing down into understanding the development that we're talking about today, you know, when you start to treat this in kids, you start to see the parents bring these kids in and if they have similar issues, they're breaking your stuff. And so, you know, if we, even from a, from a pure, like honest to goodness, selfish business dentistry standpoint, if you, if that's what you're in it for, quote, quote unquote, you just want to do good dentistry, and not have a break. There's also a reason to start looking at these adult patients and kind of correlating what you're recommending for their kids to them. And also at the same time, saving yourself a lot of hassle in not having to retreat, you know, your, your restorative cases because of the same problems that you know have resulted as as a as a result of jaw development that was not proper. So you know, so you talked about what we. I want to maybe come back just just to this idea of what we what what effects this has on patients when we do expansion on the young patient. You know, we already have talked about you know what it actually does in terms of increased nasal breathing volume, nasal volume, and. Um, Talk about what we know. You, you kind of alluded to this new data that's, that's coming out that, that may be published in the future about tonsils and adenoids. That's like brand new information. Maybe we have to do less surgery. That's interesting. That's an interesting thought that we could actually treat maybe some tonsils and adenoids with, without surgery by just doing expansion, kind of this, what maybe we're going with that. What, what did we know maybe five years ago about the effects of this type of treatment? What, what has changed now? What do we know now what are we seeing now that, that kind of gets you excited about other things you can tell a patient or maybe a parent about some of the things that this is going to affect for their child um, that, that will change maybe their day-to-day -day life? I mean, I just think all of this together can, can be impactful. We're learning new things every day and, and certainly just seeing our patients and seeing the follow through, seeing the collaborative nature of some of these cases and, and like you said, selfishly, of course, we, we don't want these kids to turn into adults that, that have sleep disorders and that, and that break things, that have breakdown. And so I, I'm just thinking about patients in our practice. And it, it's not so much what do we know now, but it just it, it's seeing some of these cases over time and watching them develop and learning more and, and um, learning how to intervene sooner. 
could we show some more of the x-rays? Because I want we can talk about sinusitis too, which is kind of a crazy thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's throw that back up because that was really cool. Yeah, so here here's go. here's one. Uh, there's two patients that we have uh, images for. So um, sinusitis is sort of a an interest. So um, we we also know, and you guys alluded to this when you talked about breakage. When patients, adults and kids, when they have some sort of airway blockage, they tend to grind. And in fact, Audrey Yoon recently published a paper, January 2021, where she's the first. It's the first publication I found that correlates tongue ties, tonsils, uh, and um, poor sleep quality and grinding. Mm. And so we now, we now have definitive information that kids that are grinding tend to have some sort of airway and sleep issue. And so mm. things that are going to cause parafunction are usually going to be some sort of airway blockage. And that's going to be true for the kids that it was in her study and then also, of course, for the adults that you guys are seeing with your beautiful dentistry. And so if we look at this young man here, he's six, six and a half um, on ADHD medication, a lot of issues with anxiety behavior and definitely not sleeping through the night. And you just look at the nasal passages. Now I'm not an ENT, so I don't wanna pretend to be one, but I can, as a lay person, I can see all the stuff in his sinuses. Of course, we see the lower teeth are tipped in we see the narrow maxilla. And as we expand, these images are similar to the last, they're about nine months apart. Not only are the teeth lined up in the bone and, and uh, loaded on their long axis, but now we see a widening of the nasal floor and the sinus is clear. And it's, this is not just one patient. This is, we see this over and over and over that the sinus is clear with expansion. And we can make some guesses about why that happens. Most likely it's an opening of what's called the osteomeatal complex and also just how the sinuses drain and we just open everything up and, and they become more efficient nasal breathers. Things are able to drain, the body's able to clear things more efficiently. And, and, then, and then in turn, clinically behavior changes. So we see less grinding, we see better sleep quality, we see, um, in, in improvement in in sleep and in school and all the other things. And then importantly too, from a skeletal growth and development standpoint, these kids aren't mouth breathing anymore. Mm -hmm. Now we can focus on myofunctional therapy. Now we can focus on tongue up and all the other important pieces. So why is it that this doesn't relapse? Uh, what is what, because we talk about, you know, growth and how much is determined by genetics. And then we're going to influence that, but there's some aspect of this, and this is this is kind of a leading question here. But we know it's kind of what created the problem: the lack of proper tongue posture, the lack of proper lip posture, swallowing reflex, all of these things. So, what? How do we influence that musculature? And I know again, this is a question that you know the answer to because it's you know where we talk about therapy, but. Um, so we're going to be talking in a future show about you know what therapy does, but do things it, without things like dealing with the musculature. Do we see relapse in these cases, or, or or can this be a permanent change without therapy, without dealing with the muscles? You know, do, how much do we know about that? Uh, it's very important. So I think that the tongue is the best retainer, and lips together, tongue up is going to be key to longevity of our results. And if you have a child that has residual adenoids and tonsils following expansion, if you have a child with a tongue tie that can't get that tongue up and forward, if you have underlying habits, you, we're not going to see the outcome we would like to see. And that's when we continue to see growth going in the wrong direction. And unfortunately, we do have cases like that. And in our study that we're hoping to publish, we do have a few non-responders. And so we're talking amongst ourselves right now, why is it the majority of, of patients that we've looked at, the adenoids and tonsils shrunk, but why is it that some did not? Is it genetics, like you mentioned? Is it environmental? Maybe they have a, an allergy to pets and they still have a family pet. 
maybe their thumb suckers, maybe that tongue is low, maybe those patients are tongue tied. And so we're still trying to piece that all apart. But function plays such a huge role in the successful outcome of these cases. So that kind of leads to this final uh, case that I think is a great one to kind of highlight because there's a lot of stuff in this next one, right? And so I'm going to put it back up on the screen here, and I'm going to go ahead and go to that final image that you sent us and talk a little bit about this case. Sure. So um, similar to the previous ones, this was a six and a half year old female and the chief complaint was grinding. Now, interestingly, she was only in the primary dentition, so none of her adult teeth were in yet. And so I know in the orthodontic world, it's a little bit controversial to start expansion so early, uh, but, but she was quite symptomatic. She didn't necessarily present with a crossbite, but she, she, the parents, she saw ENT, I think that they were, I think they had already potentially even taken out adenoids at this time, and she still was symptomatic. And so if we look at the picture before expansion, we see, now granted she moved a little bit, so it's a little blurry, but there's fluid in the sinuses. And so she's having a really tough time breathing through her nose, and we see that very low tongue posture. And so this is within eight or nine months before and after, and we see that that tongue is able to fill the oral cavity and the sinus is drained. And so was her tongue posture low because she didn't have enough space and she was mouth breathing? I don't know. Um, but so talking about stability, if we can't get that tongue up and forward, we're not gonna be able to retain this correction. If we can't maintain nasal breathing, we might not maintain these patent nasal passages. And so all of this treatment, all of this intervention is interdisciplinary. We, we need to include sleep physicians, pediatricians when appropriate, uh, myofunctional therapists, tongue tie release when needed. All of this has to come into play uh, in order to maintain the correction that we're, that we're aiming for. And, and we haven't even talked about directional, uh, um, you know, like we're just talking about the transverse. So now imagine you have a patient with a deficient mandible. There's a lot of controversy about mandibular growth in the orthodontic community and how do we grow a mandible, right? That's sort of our uh, holy grail. How do you grow a mandible? But if we think that getting that tongue up and forward, if we can get that right the tongue inserts into the mandible so if we can get that tongue up and forward one would think that that's going to drive the growth of the lower jaw but that means we have to intervene early if mm -hmm. we let these kids mouth breathe if we let these kids bite their lower lip and have their tongue hanging out all mm -hmm. through their adolescence and we wait till they're 12 or 13 you sort of get what you get at 12 or 13 mm -hmm. we can influence it a little bit but I think the best research shows about three millimeters of mandibular growth with something like a fixed functional appliance. If you have a six, nine, 10 millimeter overjet, three millimeters isn't gonna do it. <laughs> right. And now you get into disc displacement and, and all these other co confounding factors that it, it's just, yep. so early intervention. Setting people up for surgery, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, early intervention, you were saying. Oh, just the importance of, of intervening early. And intervention, intervention might not always mean orthodontic intervention. So for everybody listening, maybe that means getting that child to the ENT. Maybe it means looking at that tongue tie in, in the infant. It might mean talking to families about posture and the importance of nasal breathing. Maybe getting them on nasal steroids if that's appropriate. Just... In intervention can take a lot of, can present in a lot of different ways. So we've said a lot here, and yeah. I think it, it piques interest, right, in the minds of people that maybe this hits close to home with somebody you know, and you're listening to this show, and you're thinking, man, I've been on the, like John said, the edge about maybe learning more about this, or, or you're ready to kind of go to the next level. Right. And the next level course that John and I have been wanting to take, right, is what um, 
Rebecca has been working on with Dr. Gunson. And as we kind of wind down the show, I want to talk a little bit about that course and, and you shared. I'm going to put it up on the screen here um, as we're discussing it. Tell me why that you uh, feel like this course is kind of like unique. I mean, because there's not a lot of people talking about how to intervene. Sure. So, um, well, well, first I'll say for those that, that you already mentioned, Jeff Rouse, a uh, huge mentor role model for me. And if anyone has the opportunity to take his courses at Spear and the curriculum they're building at Spear, and, and I'm grateful to be a part of that, it is really phenomenal in terms of integrating airway into all aspects of dentistry. And so Mike Gunson and I are part of an interdisciplinary course at Spear which is phenomenal if everybody gets a chance to, to look at that course. And then um, Dr. Guns and I are also working on a three-day course that'll be in Seattle in November that is going to really do a deep dive on skeletal growth and development. And we're going to really be looking at um, underbites, overbites, crossbites, deficient maxilla, deficient mandible, TMJ breakdown, and all the things that play into skeletal growth and development, how do we intervene early? What's the solution if we um, wait until they're an adult? And if any of you guys have ever seen Dr. Gunson's surgeries, it's, he, he's unbelievable in terms of his understanding of the system. So we really talk about the system and the balance and how everything plays, uh, interplays with, with, with everything from tongue to lips to, to joints, to breathing, of course, and airway. So come so join us in Seattle. Yeah, and you're going to learn with this. It sounds like the science behind it, and then also the the actual treatment protocols. You're going to see, uh, you know, step by step treatment protocol. That's been the thing that I think we've been really looking for because we've seen the cases. You know, we've seen that some. I mean, if you go to you go to Spear, you're going to see some awesome, you know, before and afters. Dr. Gunson shows, you know, what he's doing sort of with surgery, but the the, the before and after doesn't really do justice to the workup as much and to each step and when each thing is appropriate, um, treatment strategies, you know, and I think that that's really what it is. It's more of a strategy here <laughs> because this is more than just a, uh, you know, a protocol. It really is like trying to think about everything you need to, to take into to account here, which is a ton. So that course is in November. And I mean, you know, Seattle, not a bad place to be. So if you're, uh, you know, wanting to, again, in this world, the post COVID world, we're all wanting to, uh, go, I think, and reconnect with, with people and see, uh, uh, you know, firsthand what, uh, what we can learn. So definitely check this course out and check out like, uh, like Dr. Baca said, what Spears doing. If you want even just a good introduction into what's happening and how this kind of correlates with, the facially generated treatment planning idea, uh, with the restorative dentistry idea, with the airway prosthodontics and appliance world, uh, which are some of the things that a lot of people get interested in first. You know, that's a great pathway uh, to walk down. So this this show kind of gets me it gets me very excited. It kind of leads up to what we're going to be doing, working with Dr. Baca a little bit more, along with uh, we, we we're trying to set everything up for this, but with Dr. Gunson potentially. Uh, with a pediatric dentist friend that uh, she does a ton of her workups and some surgery with, uh, and also myofunctional therapist. So we're going to be trying to build uh, kind of a case here for how the team, what the team's supposed to look like, the roles in the team, and how each team member influences the outcomes of these cases. So you know, stay tuned uh, to the dental guys for some upcoming shows that we're setting up, where we're going to be able to kind of walk you through how to put this together piece by piece. Maybe not every, I mean, you're going to go to this course that we're talking about in Seattle to actually le learn the treatment strategies. But we're going to try to find out how Dr. Baca and her team are approaching this, who all is on the team, what their roles are, what they do, and that's going to be coming up. And then we're going to maybe come back at the end with another show to talk about adult treatment again and actually have some interdisciplinary discussion on adults and what we do when we don't get the intervention that we want in the pediatric population. So once again, thanks for being with us on the show. I know you're super busy. You're just lecturing this morning and then running over to do this with us. And we just appreciate your time very, very much. And just, uh, just giving, giving us your knowledge today. 
Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it very much. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So if you've been listening to this show and you've gotten some good stuff, if you've learned something today, if it's challenged you, if it's made you think differently, if it makes you want to go take a course or hear the next show with Dr. Bacow, uh, we want to hear from you. We want some feedback on what you liked and what uh, you want to hear more of. So the best way to tell people that you love dental guys is to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That is a way that you, we get our show out to those who don't know about us. It's a way that you can connect with us and tell us what you think about us. Um, you can also connect with us on the socials. So that's, of course, the Instagram, the Twitter, the Facebook, all of those things. We're on all of them. And we want to hear from you. We want you to show us your cases, show us your crazy airway cases, show us the controversial things that we all like to talk about and show us how you're taking it to the next level in your practice. And also, if you have questions for Dr. Bacow, uh, maybe you can post some of those up there. We'll see if we can get those to her and see if we can get the expert to weigh in. So once again, it's been a great show and thanks for listening. Tune in next time as we bring you more cutting edge knowledge and good stuff and taking it to the next level. That's what we do here on The Dental Guys. Mm -hmm.